and really honored. I visited uh, the campus once uh, two years ago when uh, Professor Reddy organized a workshop on maritime history. Um, and the reason why I'm delighted uh, to be presenting this talk is um, it draws on my own research and the work that I have done both on maritime history and the history of archaeology. So essentially, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say today uh, draws on um, stuff that I have researched, worked on, um, and your response um, and your questions um, would um, really encourage me to do more. So please uh, do ask questions um, and um, do raise issues which you feel need to be worked on better. So um, let me start with, with this talk. Uh, first thing I'd like to apologize, uh, the C of the Constitution of India should have been capital. So do think that that's a, a capital C and not a small C um, uh, as it is on this presentation. So let me start with why am I doing this and um, what are these series of lectures on maritime history that I have proposed here. There are three points which I would like to make. The first point is that if you actually read the history of India, particularly the history of ancient India, I would argue, and I have taught many years in uh, the Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, that a lot of this history is written from the standpoint of the Ganga Valley. It is not written from the standpoint of the huge coastline that India has. Um, so the focus of a lot of um, history of ancient India is really on empires, on agricultural expansion, on trade, um, and on various developments of temples, art, and architecture, but much less on uh, maritime history. So that's my first point. My second point is, and particularly also the reason why I think this uh, subject is important, uh, that if you read secondary sources, and uh, I remember this came up also in the last time we met here, um, that there is, a, there is an assumption among scholars um, that um, a lot of Indians, or Indians in general, did not travel across the ocean um, because of the Dharmashastras, the injunction in the Dharmashastras, which states that people should not go across the seas. So this is my second point, that there is this assumption, it is a very strong assumption, you read it in secondary sources, um, and um, I have heard people even come up in questions and ask me that how is it that there is a whole full-fledged maritime history you're talking about when the Dharmashastras have a very different point of view on this. So that's the second reason why I think um, uh, I would like to talk to you about this. My third point is that, um, a lot of the history of ancient India is written uh, from the point of view of kings, of empires, of the state, um, and the small communities, the communities who were fishing and sailing communities, the, the communities who actually built the boats that sailed the ocean, the communities who lived along the coastline, none of these communities, um, these small communities, ever get reflected uh, in the writing of history. So I think these are very, three very important reasons why um, uh, maritime history um, should be discussed and um, should, be, um, uh, should be thought about in greater detail than it has at the moment. And this is my reason for doing the, the four lectures that I'm doing here today and tomorrow. Uh, coming back to my, um, to my present lecture, um, the present lecture is about the Constitution of India, the book or the, um, the writing of the Constitution, um, uh, which was accepted, we just celebrated the Republic Day, and the Constitution of India, as you know, was accepted and promulgated in 1950. So what interests me about the Constitution of India are two things. Um, one is a certain sense of transnationalism uh, that pervades the Constitution's um, understanding of the history and archaeology of India. And I will explain in a moment how does the constitution, which is a political document, how does it uh, relate to history and archaeology. So I'll just come up, come with that in a moment. 
Uh, but my first point is that there is a sense of transnationalism. This sense of transnationalism draws on two major themes. One is Buddhism and the spread of Buddhism across not just uh, India but across Asia. Uh, and the fact that Buddhism went in an earlier period, it, was, it found its roots in India but then spread across uh, large parts of South and Southeast Asia. The second theme and the second issue of transnationalism that is important to me uh, is the Mauryan king Ashok. Uh, the Mauryas ruled in the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE, BC. Uh, they are often written about in histories of India as the first who uh, brought together the entire country under one political rule. Um, and um, Ashok is also known for having sent emissaries to large parts of Southeast Asia to preach Buddhism. So the reason why, um, uh, why the constitution is uh, significant is that it, it, it sort of builds in a certain sense of transnationalism um, in uh, the paintings, which I will talk about just in a minute. Uh, the second sense of transnationalism um, is also evident in um, various events and activities related to archaeology in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I have written here, which uh, you, will, you will see as I go along, is that uh, through archaeology, relics and reliquaries were found in excavations, in archaeological excavations, and that they were used for political gains and they were gifted to kings of Thailand and Burma. So there is a whole, um, there is a whole new development in the 19th and 20th centuries. This new development leads to the beginnings of archaeology. This new development leads to writings on Ashok. This new development leads also to the discovery of Buddhism. Let me also be very clear that the present study of Buddhism really started in the last two to three hundred years ago, uh, the way in which we understand Buddhism today. So for this reason, I think it is important that we understand or we start the discussion on maritime history with not the ancient period but with the modern period and with the last, uh, with the 20th and 19th centuries. So why is the constitution, the constitution of India important? Um, as I mentioned, it was uh, put together, or there was a committee which was set up. This committee had 284 men and women. What is also interesting is that these men and women were of different political leanings. They came from different political uh, parties, but they came together to put to uh, work and draft the constitution of India which came into effect on 26 January 1950. Um, what, is lesser, what is less known, I mean these two facts are known and everybody knows this, and I'm sure all of you know that, what is, uh, what is not so widely known is that there was an original copy of the constitution which was signed and it has, if you actually go to the parliament house in Delhi and go to the parliament museum, you can actually see this copy of the constitution. And uh, this copy was signed by all the people who participated in drafting the constitution. Uh, that is one. Second thing is that this original copy has paintings. And it has um, 22 paintings. These paintings were done by Nandalal Bose. Nandalal Bose uh, worked in Shantiniketan with Rabindranath Tagore. He was a major influence in uh, the setting up not just of Vishwabharati, and the art uh, school at Shantiniketan, but he's also known as the father uh, of modern Indian art. Um, so he has contributed these um, 22 paintings in the, uh, in the Constitution of India. So the first time that I came across this, I was quite startled, because why have uh, the Constitution of India as a political document, a, why have paintings in this? And in that sense, I think the Constitution of India is unique. Second point is that these paintings could have been about anything. They could have been about you know, birds, flora, fauna, architecture, whatever. 
These paintings draw on archaeology. Uh, so Nandalal Bose, when he chose the themes of his paintings, he drew on archaeology and history for these paintings. Um, just to give you an example, the, uh, the national emblem that you see on the left hand side, uh, this was found during archaeological ex excavations uh, at Sarnath, which is an archaeological site near Varanasi, near Banaras. Um, and it was not until the early 20th century that people knew about this lion capital. Uh, so that is, uh, it is important that something which emerged in the early 20th century in archaeological excavations should have been adopted as the national emblem uh, of, um, um, of the Free Republic of India. And secondly, that Nandalal Bose, this is a painting that he made in the Constitution of India, should have painted this beautiful lion capital in the Constitution. The other one, which is on the other side, on, uh, uh, on my left, on, on your right, is, um, is a Harappan seal. Now this Harappan seal, again, the Harappans, as you know, archaeological excavations were only done in the 1920s, and before the 20th century, nobody knew about the Harappans. So uh, this seal really comes up, really becomes important in the 20th century. And this is one of the seals that was painted by Nandlal Bose um, in, as you see, you know, part one of the constitution talks about the union and the territory, which goes on into the politics of it. But then on top of that, you have this Harappan seal. Uh, not just the constitution, uh, a lot of the stamps, a lot of the other paraphernalia, government stationery, if you today see government stationery, you find the lion capital um, on it very nicely embedded in gold. So um, there is a lot of, um, the, one sees um, this popularized uh, both as postage stamps. The one on, um, on, the, um, on the right is uh, again a stamp which shows the stoop, the Dhamik stoop at Sarnath, where the lion capital was found. Let me take you to a letter, and I find this letter really startling, and I find this letter really interesting on two counts. This is a letter which was uh, written uh, by the president to the, our first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. The letter is in the National Archives. The letter says that uh, Nandalal Bose may be commissioned uh, to carry out this work of painting, of providing these paintings in the Constitution of India. And the second point he says, and this is what I find startling, is um, that, um, and I quote, I had informed him that I would pay for the work. He has so far asked only for the actual cost of material. So I thought, hmm. So there's a certain sense of ownership, there's a certain sense of belonging that Nandalal Bose clearly feels here. Otherwise, he could have asked for the moon and uh, you know, for painting, for providing these paintings uh, in the Constitution of India. So what are these paintings? Uh, Nandalal Bose, I give the dates, uh, his dates are 1883 to 1966. So uh, by the middle um, of the 20th century, he had passed away. These 22 paintings all relate to archaeology and history. I talked about the Harappan seal. Uh, there's also paintings of Gupta art. There is, um, as you know, a temple at Mahabalipuram, temples at Orissa, and again, all these are painted in the constitution. There are boats, and this, from my point of view, I find quite uh, exciting and interesting that there should be boats uh, which should have been painted not just from Mohanjadaro and India, but also from Indonesia. Borobudur is a Buddhist monument in central Java. And um, uh, Bose argues that this monument in central Java represents India's maritime heritage. I'm not going to explain that, and if somebody remembers by the end of the talk that I did mention it, I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, it also, uh, the paintings also include leaders, so they're not just about archaeology and history, they're also about our leaders. Um, there are several of them, Mahatma Gandhi of course, Subhash Chandra Bose, 
but also uh, medieval kings like um, Akbar, Shivaji, and the 10th Guru of Sikhism. This is a very, very good example of the transnationalism that I was talking about. This is one of the paintings um, in the Constitution. Uh, this painting uh, shows Ashoka spreading his dhamma, his dharma or Buddhism. You see Emperor Ashok, um, you see on the, where the arrow is on uh, the left hand side. Uh, he's sitting on, a, on an elephant, he's bejeweled, he has his turban. And uh, this, according to Nandalal Bose, uh, shows that he is taking or he's spreading uh, uh, Buddhism uh, across the ocean to Southeast Asia and to other parts of Asia. There are Buddhist monks who are depicted uh, right on the right hand side. Um, they are shown with shaven heads. They are shown with their uh, traditional uh, monks uh, attire. And uh, so this, uh, uh, it is interesting that when uh, Nandalal Bose chooses to show Emperor Ashok, he chooses a scene uh, which talks about or which shows the spread of Buddhism uh, from India to uh, Southeast Asia. So my first question when I looked at this was, um, why was this done? What does this mean? I mean, why do you need history and archaeology um, in, uh, in a political document, in a document which is uh, talking about 1950s India, which is talking about the future of India? Uh, so, uh, the, um, where I went to look for answers was in the archives and um, in the debates that happened at the time when the constitution was being framed. And um, in that debate, one sees back and forth questions and answers about uh, what is the relationship between the past and the present? Is there a relationship? Why study the past? What relevance does it have for the present or for the future? And um, I found this quite significant that many of our parliamentarians sort of really engaged with this question and really engaged with the fact that uh, the past um, has a meaning in the present and in the future. And as one of them said, we are studying the past not because we want to replicate it. There's no way we can replicate it, that's for sure as he says, that you cannot transform India of today into the India of Rigvedic times, but that the idea of the past, the idea of what this past represents, and the idea of um, the heritage of this country cannot be rejected. So in a certain sense, what the parliamentarians were trying to do is to find a balance between the past present and the future. Remember, the Constitution of India is a document which looks at the future. It tells the government what it should do about various aspects of uh, the politics of this country. So in a certain way, um, a balance was trying to be, was uh, the parliamentarians were looking for a balance between uh, the past, between archaeology, and what they were putting together, which is a document for the present and for the future. And this balance was in trying to depict the culture and civilization of the country. And that is where, that is my first point, that is where I would argue that these paintings have a place in this, in this political document, in the Constitution of India. And that is why the paintings could have been about anything, even if paintings were to be included, but that they draw on ancient Indian history and archaeology. And uh, if you have counter arguments, I would be delighted to hear, because that is my point, and that is something which uh, I think I believe in, but we can certainly discuss if you have counter positions. I have, I have a little question. So, yeah. you know, like, you were mentioning how Harappa was important. Do you think there's also this ongoing idea of the older it is, the, the better it is, the, the, the kind of more glorious it is if it extends farther into the past? Um, uh, you know, something which I argue um, in the book, uh, The Return of the Buddha, and something which I argue here, is um, I'm, not sense, um, I'm not sure it is a sense of chronology. What I think is a sense of what the media popularizes. And I think in what was picked up 
whether it's the Harappans, whether it's the Mauryas, or whether it's Buddhists, uh, were things which were very widely reported in the press at this point in time. And, you know, and I've looked at the newspapers um, starting uh, 19th century, and it's quite extraordinary. I mean, you don't get that kind of coverage even today of archaeology. But the kind of coverage and the extensive coverage that one finds in the media, uh, that's one that emerges very, you know, uh, that emerges uh, very clearly. And the second thing which emerges very clearly is that a lot of our uh, political leaders, you know, Nehru, Gandhi, many of the others, were actually visiting archaeological sites. So it's not something which they, which they sort of just read about, but they actually visited that. The third point is, and again, uh, this is Gandhi's notion of the past. The third point that's very interesting is that many of the sessions of the, of the Congress party you know, were held outside towns, outside major towns. And uh, uh, at that point, exhibitions were held. And in fact, Nantlal Bose did two major exhibitions for the Congress. One was on paintings in India, you know, where he draws from Ajanta paintings right into the modern paintings. And the second exhibition that he did was Village Life in India. So the point I'm making is that, um, uh, it, uh, that's my sense, it had very little to do with chronology and, you know, uh, uh, sort of ancient past and the third millennium beginnings of Indian history. And I would argue it had to do with, the, with, the, with this constant struggle. What does this mean for modern India? And this you get also in the, in the debates that you get in the, uh, you know, for the Constituent Assembly debates. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So uh, now the, the other point, and this is a point, this is a quote, which, um, you know, the point you just raised, that uh, uh, historians have argued that, uh, you know, all independent nations, India was becoming independent, all of them got to establish their uh, antiquity, their ancient uh, culture, their ancient heritage, uh, and they want to establish a separate identity. And so India was no different, and hence this. But as I've just explained, I think there was more to it than just looking for, uh, for antiquity. And um, uh, there's also a sense that Bose uh, was a firm believer, Nandlal Bose was a firm believer that art uh, is not only for the elite, so it's not something which five people in Delhi or you know five people in our major cities can appreciate or talk about. But if the community didn't understand this art, it had no meaning. So what what use is art if nobody can understand it or if nobody can relate to it? And um, as I've just said, that um, a lot of this was actually put into practice uh, at the Congress sessions where exhibitions were held where um, uh, a lot of people visited. And for example, uh, in 1936, at the Lucknow Congress session, Bose had arranged uh, an exhibition on the historical panorama of Indian art. In 36, he had talked about art by local artists, and he had built a township of local materials. So he was talking about local materials, local art. Um, and uh, again, he produced a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of paintings on the daily life of villagers. So uh, between leaders such as Gandhi, Nehru, uh, Ambedkar again, uh, another uh, strong leader in the Constitution of India, and Nandalal Bose and his vision of what is the relevance of art and what is the relevance of history, I think it came together in, um, in putting, these, uh, you know, putting these paintings into the Constitution. Uh, this is again Nandlal Bose's paintings, which were displayed, and uh, um, in fact they sold very widely. You know, it was not as if these were kept uh, for a for a very you know small elite. But both his painting, which was done in 1930 of Mahatma Gandhi, and his painting of Sati, these were painted also as postcards and uh, distributed very widely. My second question is that who chose these visuals? Uh, I mean, after all, there, Indian history is very vast. It starts from uh, the prehistoric period to the modern period. There are only 22 paintings. So um, who chose these and um, what is the, uh, what or who decided that uh, 
uh, these have to be included and not something else. Um, I've tried to find an answer and I haven't found one, so if any of you have any suggestions, I would be very, very delighted to hear those. Uh, because, um, as I would argue, and I've just said, that these, uh, the, the themes that were chosen uh, were chosen uh, uh, because uh, they were widely reported in the press and they found a lot of, um, a lot of interest amongst the general public. Now let me st uh, stop very briefly and let me ask the students, uh, has anybody seen the Constitution of India? I mean the actual copy, has anybody seen it? Excellent, okay, three, where did you see it? There's a copy in the library. Oh wonderful, and did you see the paintings? Yes. Oh excellent, okay, all three of you? You've seen it in the? Okay. And again, does that, is that the original copy with the paintings? Okay. And you've seen it as well in the... Oh, uh, thanks. Thanks for that. And I'm glad that you've seen this. And I'm glad that you've also noticed the, the very beautiful quality of the paintings. Um, I'm not sure if these are in color or black and white? They're in color. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's interesting. So my question is, who decided this, you know? And uh, why, um, why archaeology? Why not something else? And this brings me to my second uh, theme of today, which is that archaeology is a new discipline. And this is something which I said. Archaeology came up as a discipline only in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. And it came to India in, um, under the British rule, because we were ruled by the British at that time. And it is the British who then set up institutions for the study of archaeology and it was the British who then brought archaeology as a discipline to India. So the point then is archaeology is a new discipline. All, all societies have a sense of history but archaeology is something which has developed only over the last three to four hundred years. The second point, Buddhism um, as we study today uh, again, is some is a discipline of Buddhology, which came about again in the last two to three hundred years. This happened because of manuscripts, the manuscripts that were found. These were collected. These were taken to Europe. These were translated, and um, um, the um, these manuscripts and this development led to the search or led um, um, various archaeologists to search for the historical Buddha. Again, I'm not going to talk about historical Buddha. We'll talk about it if you still remember when I've finished. Two points very quickly. Um, the Archaeological Survey of India was set up in 1861, but was set up by the British, and the Director Generals were British. Um, now, what do you think, uh, the students, um, what do you think, if, um, if you can put yourself back in the 19th century, in 1861, and if you were the Director General of Archaeology, what do you think would be uh, what you would look for? I mean, what would you think one um, could be the priority at that point? Anybody? Come along, don't, don't go to sleep. Yeah? Search for trophies, which I can take back home. Wonderful, excellent, search for trophies. And what would these trophies be? Sculptures, right? Um, in fact, at one point, the British were also planning to take back Sanchi. I don't know if you visited Sanchi. Sanchi is a huge monument. It has huge gateways, but they were actually planning to take that back and uh, rebuild it, but that didn't happen. Search for trophies, wonderful. The second point, I have said out there, the search for Alexander the Great. Why Alexander the Great? Because uh, the British, the Europeans, they related to Greek history, not to Sanskrit, not to the Buddha. Their search or their uh, point of reference were the Greeks. Who is the most important Greek known in history? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great came to India, we know that, from Greek texts. He established cities in India and the Greek texts talk about um, how uh, these cities were really centers for civilization of these uneducated, illiterate Indians. Um, and that's what the British were trying to do. Um, so in a certain 
way uh, the British archaeologists. Maybe Yeah, just one second. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, um, so when, so uh, in, 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 in essence, what the British were trying to do was to look for their past and legitimization of their present. Sorry, yeah. Not at all. Atul Singh. Um, I've been asked to introduce myself because of the camera here. So a very interesting addition is that the British did take back the Amravati marbles. That's on the first floor of the British Museum, where I have spent a considerable amount of time. And the entire public school education in the 19th century, which was established by Matthew Arnold's father, who came up with the idea of rugby at rugby, was predicated on a mastery of the classics. Yes. And lest we forget, Lord Byron died fighting for the Greek War of Independence. Yes. So the entire British identity was predicated, was based on classical identity, and they saw themselves as intellectual heirs to the Greeks and as imperial heirs to the Romans. And Pax Britannica was modeled on Pax Romana. So it's understandable that they'd go out to search uh, for Alexander because that connects them yes. to a long, uh, long glorified past and gives them legitimacy in their own eyes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes, exactly. You know, so that's why uh, the British archaeologist Alexander Cunningham, he had, um, he had two visions. One was, um, you know, searching for uh, the Greeks, and the best Greek, of course, Alexander the Great, who conquered, uh, who conquered India, and um, you know, um, the British saw themselves as really heirs. And it's really fascinating. And thanks for raising this. It's really fascinating that if you read, uh, if you actually read accounts by early British uh, military officials. Uh, the one problem is Afghanistan, always, always. It's today, it's always been. Uh, so they want to find out a route, how to go to Afghanistan. And then they say, in, and, and I've, you know, I can quote in black and white. They say, okay, so now whose route should we follow? Because there are several, uh, several medieval um, um, uh, you know, adventurers who also came uh, through, the, through the passes into India. So they say, no, the best person to follow is Alexander the Great. And it's unbelievable that in the 20th century, when they are looking for routes into Afghanistan, they actually go back and read Alexander to find his strategies, his military strategies, his routes into uh, Afghanistan, and the way in which uh, this Greek past not just uh, legitimizes their rule, but also guides them uh, into uh, winning military trophies. So that's, um, that's a fascinating aspect um, of this whole beginnings of archaeology. And as you know, and this you know very well, uh, the Northwest, Afghanistan, is not very easy terrain. It's inhospitable terrain. It's inhospitable when, when the British and the French were trying to get into Afghanistan. There were no routes, there are no maps which sort of very clearly plotted out where they should go. Uh, and so this was a big, uh, a big question mark and a big uh, hurdle in 19th century India. So the, uh, what is also quite fascinating is this overlap that then happens between military espionage and archaeology. And many of the early archaeologists were not sort of trained archaeologists in the way in which we think of archaeologists today, but were actually uh, military surveyors, were uh, also uh, people uh, you know, who were uh, interested in making a quick buck. So what they were doing is they were collecting uh, sculptures, they were collecting coins, they were collecting other, uh, other important artifacts, and selling them to museums. So archaeology was, uh, was uh, um, an important money-making practice because you could collect and you could sell. It was also an overlap with a lot of military activities that were happening at that time. Um, and one, uh, one interesting, I can just quote one, there are many, um, uh, including um, uh, Mackenzie, uh, who collected the um, Amaravati marbles, uh, Colin Mackenzie, who was also a military surveyor. I will only quote Charles Mason. 
His dates are 1800 to 1853. It's not very clear whether he was American or whether he was English. Uh, the, um, the East India Company uh, referred to him as a deserter, and for many years he was persona non grata. But then the problem was that uh, nobody knew Afghanistan better than Charles Mason because he knew the local language, he could dress as an Afghan, you know, he could be, uh, he could sort of pass as an Afghan. So the British then gave him money and gave him a grant um, to spend uh, three years in uh, Kabul, in the Kabul Jalalabad region. And uh, the outcome or the flip off of this was that uh, everything that he collected had to be given um, back to the East India Company and was sent to the museums. And uh, he was also appointed as a news writer in Kabul and then eventually returned um, to the, uh, 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 eventually got a pension from the East India Company. So the point I'm trying to make is that a lot of rules were then bent uh, because Charles Mason was so important um, to uh, the British. Now one of the, one of the things, one of the artifacts that Mason collected were coins. Um, and these coins, and largely these coins came from Afghanistan. And uh, these coins were bilingual. So on one side they had Greek legends, on the other side they had Brahmi and Prakrit legends. Now this is a whole story of, you know, how these coins have been studied and what eventually happened to them. But the reason why these coins are important to my story is that these then led to the decipherment of the Brahmi script. Now, what is the Brahmi script? Any, any sort of suggestions from the back? What is the Brahmi script? Why was it not deciphered? Why did it have to be deciphered? Come along, GK, yeah. Hello, no? Yes. Brahmi is a script which was used for writing the local Prakrit uh, dialects. Okay, excellent. And, uh, the reason it was not deciphered uh, is unclear to me, but I'll try to take a guess. Mm -hmm. Because it did not have a grammar, uh, uh, grammar written, mm -hmm. which could be referred to, like Sanskrit. Uh, so, because of its absence, they couldn't decipher it, and the knowledge of Prakrit was lost for a very long time, till mm -hmm. uh, James Prinsip discovered it back in 1837. Uh, yes, the beginning and the end is correct. I think somewhere in the middle we need to uh, <laughs> refine the argument. So the beginning is wonderful that it is a script. So it is, uh, it is a script, not a language, okay? Uh, Ashoka used the Brahmi script in the 3rd century BC. So he's the first one who used this script. Now gradually, uh, you know, um, uh, the script changes. You know how uh, in the medieval period how English was written and how we write it today. So the Roman script, you know, the, so the scripts change. So gradually the Brahmi script changed. And um, actually our Devanagari and most of our modern scripts really emerged from Brahmi, but they have changed over time. Uh, so the first point, well taken, it is a script. So by the 20th century, it had changed. So what people knew was its changed um, form and not its old form. Second point, James Princep deciphered the script. He read the script. So because it had changed, nobody could read this. And again, there are very interesting accounts when uh, English travelers or when archaeologists, they go to look at the Ashokan pillar uh, and they ask uh, the local people, okay, what's written on this pillar? So the local people call you know, somebody, a wise man from the village, and they say, okay, he knows it. So he rattles off something and says, yes, this is written on this pillar. Point is, nobody can check for sure because nobody anyway can, uh, you know, read this. Um, so in a, and that is the reason why the knowledge of the script was lost. Uh, uh, nobody could read the script and it is only when Charles Mason uh, discovered these bilingual coins, people knew Greek. So they knew what the, what the corresponding uh, a letter or character was uh, for that uh, for that term in uh, uh, in um, uh, in Prakrit, and that is how the script was read. Okay, so now um, when these people went around, what did they see? They saw these heaps of brick. These are spooks. In the early 20th century, these they were called toads. And again, you have several archaeologists. 
um, describing these and describing in their surveys that uh, you know they went around and they discovered these topes. Except, small point, um, these topes they enshrined the relics of the Buddha or they enshrined the relics of important Buddhist monks. So this was the landscape which the early uh, British archaeologists, when they traveled in the Northwest, when they uh, traveled around in large parts of North India, this was largely North India, we're not going South India. South India is out of reckoning at this point. Uh, so what they discovered were these topes or stoops. Uh, stoops, I have argued, are either is a shrine uh, or a chaitya, but it is also a funerary structure because it enshrines the relics of the Buddha. The, now the issue was, when is the earliest stoop dated? Of course, it couldn't be dated pre-Buddhist because it, was, it enshrined the relics of the Buddha. I've given you two dates, and that's typically of how historians don't often agree on, uh, you know, a lot of even on chronology. Um, so the traditional date is um, 7 to 6th century BC, while the modern uh, historians argue for a much later date. Now what is interesting is that Ashokan edicts already talk about um, a stoop. In one of his uh, edicts he says that he visited a stoop of one of the earlier, um, uh, earlier Buddhas. Uh, so clearly, there was a connection somewhere between Ashok and the setting up of stoops. And uh, this was a connection which emerges very, very strongly. Uh, but more recent work has shown that a majority of the stoops in this country are later, really belong to the second post-Ashokan period, really belong to the uh, second century BC. And again, another point of debate is that much of the Buddhist literature doesn't talk about setting up of stoops or setting up of, um, uh, of worshipping the stoops. And this is again another story because then, you know, what is written in the text and what actually happens on the ground, uh, that is two different things. Um, this is a map of, uh, this is an early photograph, early 20th century photograph of Saatchi. Um, which is important because of its gateways and its railings, but also has a capital uh, of an Ashokan pillar, which was lying on the ground at that point, Sanchi is near Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. And this is what uh, early archaeologists discovered when they went to Sanchi. But let me bring in also uh, another aspect of this discovery and excavation of stoops which is uh, uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who was the ruler of Punjab, and um, he ruled um, in the 19th century before the English defeated him. What he also wanted to do was to, um, was to modernize his army. And for modernizing his army, he brought in uh, several French military officials who had, who had joined the Napoleon Bonaparte expedition, uh, to uh, Egypt, and a lot of them were interested in archaeology. Now, um, um, the, uh, the one person who's important for my um, narrative is Jean-Baptiste Ventura. His dates are 1792 to 1858. Uh, again, he was part of the military expedition to um, Afghanistan, but in the process, uh, he discovered and excavated uh, a major stoop, which is at Manikyala. Manikyala is very close to Takshila, which is in present-day Pakistan. Now, what is interesting is that when he discovered and excavated the stoops, he found bones. And he sent a letter to Maharaja Ranjit Singh that he's, he's discovered the burial place of Alexander's horse. Now, you may well ask, where is the story going? You know, it's supposed to be about this stoop. Uh, the French officer excavates it. Where is Alexander and where is Alexander's horse inside the story? Alexander comes in because local legend, and local legend which was based on Persian, which was based on the Persian Shahnami, uh, you talked about these stoops with reference to Sikandar. These were all known as places which were linked to Sikandar. Sikandar um, was um, the hero of the Persian epic Shahnami. Uh, now, if you translate Sikandar into English, what would you, what is the term you would use? 
what is the term you would use if you translated Sikandar's name into English? Alexander. Yes? Sikandar is Alexander. Small problem. One is Persian, another is Greek. So what is the connection between the Persian and the Greeks? Now that's another story which I'm not going into here. But when the Europeans heard Sikandar, heard Alexander, there was only one Alexander they knew. They did not know of Persians. Um, and so the local legend said that Alexander's horse had been buried in this Manikyala stoop. Uh, so when uh, Ventura excavated it uh, in 1830, and this is one of the earliest excavations, one of the earliest excavations in this country of these stoops was in 1830. And um, he, he, um, he sent back a, a letter to Ranjit Singh saying that he's found um, uh, the burial place of Alexander's horse. This is what the stoop looks like today. It's near Rawalpindi. Um, it is in present Pakistan. There's been conservation work that has been done. Now something that's also uh, you need to know about this is that uh, uh, yeah, uh, I had said that uh, these stoops enshrined relics. So where were the relics enshrined? You know, if you dig a hole from the top into the center of the stoop, that is where you would get the relics. And many of the early archaeologists, that is what they did. They would, hit, they would dig a hole from the top of the stoop down into the center to find the relics, because the relics were the ones which had precious items, which had gems, so on and so forth. And this is uh, the Manikala, the relic chamber of the Manikala stoop, which was, um, which was discovered. Now let me, um, let me sort of move on and uh, talk about uh, more recent research on this. And what was found in, uh, in the Manikala stoop were, uh, you can see these uh, on the right, the relics, the relic curies. You can see a lot of coins that were found. Um, and there was the seal chamber, which I showed you just a little while back. There's been a lot of new recent research which has been done in the British Museum. What they did was that they went through Ventura's writings. They went through you know, what he had found. And based on his writings, based on his finds of coins, they placed these coins in this, uh, in this reconstructed stoop and found that, uh, and this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is sort of interesting, that uh, the stoop belonged to different periods. So it was occasionally opened. Uh, more gifts, more items were put in, and it was expanded. So um, uh, there, was a, there was a sort of constant moving forward renovation of the stoops, and they were able to date these renovations based on the coin find. And that, uh, uh, you know, that's an important element of how in the past, uh, many of uh, what we consider monuments or heritage buildings were protected, were paid for, uh, you know, resources were made available for enlarging them and for renovating them. Uh, we move on from Ventura to Alexander Cunningham, who was uh, the first um, Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India. He was the one who argued that you need archaeology. Why do you need archaeology? Because the Purans don't mention Buddhism. And yet Buddhism is there all the time. How do you find Buddhism? You find it through archaeology. So he set up, or he was responsible for pushing the government into setting up the Archaeological Survey of India. He had two main interests. One we've talked about, Alexander the Great. Second was, um, there were several pilgrims who came to India, from China especially. One of them came in the 7th century, it's known as Xuanzang. Uh, and Xuanzang has, uh, has uh, left behind a lot of writings where he talks about his trips to India. And in these writings, uh, and at, that, at this point, these writings had been translated into English. Uh, so Alexander Cunningham argued that if you actually want to look, study Buddhism, you should read Xuanzang's writings. And that is how you will find Buddhism. So this, uh, this was um, Alexander Cunningham's um, uh, sort of uh, entry into the archaeology of Buddhism. Uh, he is known uh, for the large number of excavations that he conducted, but more importantly, he is known for having 
um, having established the identity of Ashok. Now, why would you need an example of Cunningham to, uh, to establish the identity of Ashok, of the Mauryan king Ashok? The reason you would need it is, we've said, Brahmi's script was lost. People didn't understand the script. Second point, there were a lot of edicts which had been found, which had been discovered, but uh, nobody quite knew. Uh, what, do you know what term is used for Ashok in these edicts, anybody? I mean, does it say Mauryan King Ashok or does it say some other term? Come along, yeah, you, yeah? Devanampiya Piyadasi. Yeah, Devanampiya Piyadasi. So, excellent. Now, that doesn't sound like Ashok at all. So, uh, who was this Devanampiya Piyadasi? You know, if you've actually not heard of Ashok before that, if the edicts don't say that, if Princip talks about uh, Devanampiya Piyadasi, uh, how are these edicts connected to Ashok. So what, um, what uh, Cunningham did, uh, he thought the best way forward is to look at some chronicles. And he looked at chronicles from Sri Lanka. Why Sri Lanka? Because Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country. There was still Buddhism practiced and a continuing uh, religion in Sri Lanka. And um, in the Mahavansa, which is written in the 4th, 5th century CE, uh, the Mahavansa talks about um, the fact that Ashok, uh, who's also uh, referred to as Devanam Piya Piyadasi, set up a lot of stoops in North India. And we have just talked about all these stoops that had been discovered, uh, all these inscriptions which had been deciphered. Now the only missing link was who was Piyadasi? And that missing link was then finally um, confirmed through the Mahavansa, which is a 5th century text from Sri Lanka. And, it, and Cunningham decided that this person who did it was Raja Ashok. Now my question to you is, I would argue there is a problem methodologically in here. What is the methodological question? Um, somebody else. <laughs> uh, come along, somebody else. Is there a methodological question? You're all scientists or engineers. Scientists, engineers, what? Engineers. Engineers, okay. So methodologically, there's a problem here. What is the methodological problem? Think, why, uh, why do I call it a methodological problem? Okay, let me give you some clues. Uh, what, are, what is the date of the inscriptions? Ashoka, what did I say? When was he? 3rd century BCE, okay? What is the text that is being used to, to uh, work out the history of Ashok? The Mahavansa, which is 4th, 5th century CE, AD. So there's a difference of 800 years between the event and the account, all right? So the event actually happened in 3rd century BCE, whereas the account that was used to talk about the event was written 800 years later. Given the fact that even one year later, one can't remember uh, the, the actual happening or the account of an event, um, I think 800 years is a long time. And uh, by the way, has anybody seen Roshamon? Uh, Kurosawa's, uh, uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks. Now, one of the things, Nobody from the back. Yeah, I signed that in history class. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Would you like to say something then? You know, why is Kurosawa important in uh, in this whole? Uh, uh, Kurosawa. Is... Yeah. Thanks. I think they're hearing. You know my no, no, They are recording him. Oh, it's not. Uh, your voice is wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I will. Um. Well, in, in Roshan, you have the three or four characters, and they witness a kind of an intense tragic event, and you get a perspective of this one event from multiple perspectives. And every time it's different, the story is different, the motivations of each character are kind of laid out in this process. So it's a good example of how you, know, you have to have this multi-perspective uh, approach to understanding a historical event. Just Yep, thank you. Yep, thanks. I think what Rashomon is all about is a fundamental 
philosophical idea that an individual is defined by their period, by their context, mm -hmm. by their assumptions, by their operating philosophies, and God knows what else. And the analogy of each car, of the historian as someone in a procession, means that you presumably are better off to get, uh, better off getting multiple perspectives to arrive at an approximation of truth, rather than relying on a singular version, which always has an agenda, sure. either overt or covert, either conscious or subconscious, or I may say even unconscious. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. So here, now, we're not, we're not just looking at one perspective. We are also looking at one perspective which was written down 800 years later. So clearly, there is a methodological issue here which we need to bear in mind. And the first, um, the, uh, uh, the first inscription that does mention um, uh, the, um, the term Ashok comes from Maski, which is in Karnataka, which is in North Karnataka. And that's the first inscription that does mention Ashok. But also the fact, and this takes me back to the, uh, to the transnationalism, Ashok was also the first ruler whose inscriptions were in Greek and Aramaic languages. And also the Karoshti script. We've talked about the Brahmi script, but there's also Karoshti, uh, which is the second script which is used for his inscriptions. Um, very briefly, uh, a map showing you where these inscriptions are. Uh, uh, two points I would like to talk about. One is these minor rocket eggs, which are all in South India. Uh, largely in Karnataka, uh, around Hospet, very close to, um, or uh, some miles from uh, Bangalore. Uh, and you see the minor rocket eggs. These are the earliest. These talk about uh, Ashok and what, uh, what measures he took for the spread of Dhamma. Uh, these are inscribed on rocks. Um, what is also quite interesting is that some of these rocks are in way off places, and you can't actually see them, let alone read them. The second clustering you find in the Ganga Valley, these are on pillars. These are not on rocks, these are on pillars, and the, pil the pillar edicts are in um, large parts of uh, the Ganga Valley. Uh, they also talk about um, various uh, 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 measures that Ashok took for, uh, for spread of Buddhism. Um, and his vision of what Buddhism should be. And then up in the northwest at, um, at uh, Mansera and Shavasgari, Kandahar. Uh, Kandahar, of course, has inscriptions in Greek as well. Um, and I've said 1915 is when the first inscription was found that mentions um, Ashoka. Where does that come from? It's written there, I think, somewhere. Yes, where does that come from? Come along. At least read from the slide. <laughs> yes? Where are you based? You're based in Gujarat. Where does this come from? Junagar. Yes. <laughs> it's written there. Where is Junagar? Don't tell me you haven't been there. Don't tell me you don't know it. Where is Junagar? Hmm. I think you need to, engineers should be sent on uh, sightseeing missions to Gujarat. <laughs> so uh, this comes from Junagar. It's on a rock. Um, you can see the rock at the bottom. Uh, why, it is, uh, uh, why this inscription is important, A, it's, um, uh, this is the Junagar rock inscription um, talks about the various uh, Greek kings whom Ashok sent emissaries to. So this, it's the inscription which um, talks not about his edicts and their proclamation in the local region, but also talks about the Greek kings. The second thing, uh, the second reason why the Junagar inscription is important, because other kings after him wrote on the same rock. What does that mean? What does that mean that they wrote on the same rock? Did they not know that uh, somebody had written earlier? Why did they want to put their inscriptions on the same rock? Yeah? Legitimacy. Legitimacy, also memory. Also the fact, clearly, this, uh, the Junagar rock inscription, even if this knowledge was lost in the 20th century, 
In the 4th century, when we have the Gupta inscription, or in the 2nd century, when we have Rudradavan's inscription, clearly there must have been local knowledge which talked about, uh, or which did mention, that you know, there was a king, a big king, and his inscription was inscribed here. So, um, so certainly, um, Junagar uh, is an important inscription, not just because it mentions the Greeks, but also because it contains uh, later inscriptions and hence uh, draws in uh, the whole uh, tradition of um, you know, what happened subsequently. Okay, uh, uh, the, sorry, just before that, uh, the top it shows you a pillar and a capital, and that's what a capital looks like. Let me move on a little faster. Uh, we all know these Ashokan inscriptions were then inscribed on Buddhist monuments and became uh, centers um, for um, worship, reverence, pilgrimage. This is a coin of one of the Greek kings. So we know that the, the Greek kings that Ashoka talks about in his Junagar inscription uh, actually existed because we do have coins of these Greek kings and almost all the Greek kings um, have, uh, have these coins. Um, uh, uh, and these, the names tally with the names mentioned in the Junagar inscription. Um, okay, one more thing that Ashok is famous for, and this again comes from a later source. It is a Sanskrit uh, text written um, in the second century AD, the Ashokavadana, which talks about the fact that Ashok dug up the burial, the relics of the Buddha and redistributed them into 84,000 stupas, which is a large number, so that would cover the whole world, let alone South Asia. But clearly, uh, this was something which uh, which people believed in, uh, which people actually sculpted on monuments. This is a relief from, uh, again, a 1st, 2nd century AD uh, Buddhist monument in Swat, in Pakistan. And you can see these eight little urns uh, on the table. And uh, these were the original urns where Buddha's relics were kept. And Ashoka is said to have redistributed them. Um, let me very briefly move on. I've already uh, run out of time on my first lecture, but I just want to move on to the second part, which is Sarnath. Where does Sarnath come in? And uh, when was Sarnath excavated? Today, if you go to Sarnath near Banaras, this is what you will see. Um, this is the Dhamed Stoop. It was built um, in uh, the 4th, 5th centuries. It still survives. It has been conserved. But um, when it was dug into, it um, yielded um, a, stone, uh, a stone image. And um, uh, this was taken uh, as the evidence for this place being the center um, of the first sermon uh, which Buddha delivered um, after his enlightenment. And um, this finds very prominent uh, visualization uh, very prominently depicted uh, again in the constitution and this is uh, the Buddha's first sermon as Nandalal Bose draws it and he actually uh, produces this uh, this is the Brahmi script you can see the script here so it's interesting that Bose not only uh, produced um, a replica or a, or a visualization of the first sermon but he actually also produces uh, the exact sutra, which was discovered, and this is what makes me, we go back to the same point, that you know, this is what makes me, um, uh, makes me uh, believe that um, it was the archaeological excavations which had a major bearing on, um, uh, on Bose. Um, these are photographs of the 1903 excavations. A um, couple of interesting points. Uh, you can see the, these are Indian laborers uh, when the excavations are being done, uh, some of the means of transport that are shown. Um, it's quite messy. Uh, modern excavations don't look like this. Modern excavations are more uh, scientific. Uh, they have better measurements. This seems to be like you know free-for-all where excavations or whosoever is excavating can just go about and digging it. I had said also that it's not till the 
20th, early 20th century that uh, the Ashokan pillar was found at Sarma and the Lion Capital. The Lion Capital was not on the pillar, it was near the pillar and it is these 1905 excavations um, which brought to light um, both the pillar and the Lion Capital. A point I made that this was reported widely in the media, this is Times of India 1915, it talks about a site museum which was set up to house the archaeological artifacts from the site. It also talks about publication of a catalogue, it reviews the catalogue. So there's a fair amount of reporting um, of the pillar, of the uh, lion capital uh, and of the excavations themselves, which is quite interesting and it was very different from what happens now. And if you go to the museum, I'm not sure anybody's gone to Sarnath. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. So you see this very prominently displayed in the museum um, and um, very aesthetically sculpted. Um, there's something very striking about the Sarnath capital. Would you like to say something? I mean, what struck you when you saw it? Was there something which, uh, which, which was different from other stone carvings? What? No? Yeah, Michelle? The choice of animals. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. The choice of animals. The animals are the... Look at the horse. Um, you know, the... That's the horse. And then you have the chakras in between. The wheel? Yeah. What, what, why is it shiny? It's the one of the striking things about this capital is that it has been built to impress. Yes, it's okay. Very shiny. Hmm. It, uh, it is clearly very symbolic. It's reflective of the power of the state and the emperor. Yes. And uh, it is also creating some kind of visual identity for the empire, which a national flag today does. Yes. Uh, so hmm. it, it is a statement of intent as well. Thanks, yes, and um, also something which, uh, you know, which the Mauryans were famous for, this is sandstone. Sandstone uh, doesn't normally have the polish, but the Mauryan, the Mauryan sculpture, and particularly this lion uh, capital, uh, is very striking because of the polish that it has. Uh, you know, it's, it's out, I mean, it, it just strikes you as being so powerful a symbol, um, as something which is very impressive, um, and in a certain way, yes, uh, you know, the flag and the national uh, emblem. What's uh, the wheel, I think? The okay. Wheel. Yeah. What about the wheel? No, it just struck me as uh, some, uh, somehow curious that they should choose the wheel, you know, to choose to, you know, place a wheel in between the animals and the, you know, sort of base. Yeah, thank you. So, and the wheel, again, was something which is taken up uh, in the flag. And uh, you know, there's a whole uh, there's a whole debate and a whole back and forth of writings between Gandhi and Nehru, because as you know, Gandhi wanted the chakra, he did not want the wheel, and Nehru wanted uh, the chakra because he said that symbolizes internationalism, that symbolizes that you know uh, uh, the Buddhist Dhamma went uh, to Southeast Asia, across Asia. So there's a whole again, you know, why it should be the wheel on the flag and not the chakra, which is what. Uh, Gandhi wanted. Um, so clearly there's lots, um, uh, there's lots that you know is important about the Sarnath excavation but again and this brings me to the final point is the politics of it um, and um, the politics on two counts. Um, one is that um, you know these relics that were dug up from excavations in the 19th and 20th century uh, more um, in the late 19th and less in the 20th century. Now, what should be done with these relics? Um, should they be, they be thrown? Should they be put in the museum? If you put it in the museum, what do you put? Ash? Because what are relics? Relics are ash, uh, bone. So, um, you know, do you put that in the museum? Would people be interested to see it? Um, and um, what was done was that the British then decided to gift these relics to kings um, of countries which had a living tradition of Buddhism, like Sri Lanka, like Thailand, Siam, um, 
And um, uh, so that is one, that's one point. This was mainly done in the 19th century when these relics were used for cementing political ties. And this is a tradition which has continued. I mean, if you remember recent newspaper reports, this is a tradition that continues. Uh, the, second, uh, the second reason um, why I think I, s I would make a distinction between 19th and 20th century is that in the 20th century, increasingly, um, the Mahabodhi society which had been set up, uh, a lot of Indians argued that why should something which belongs to India go outside India. So increasingly, there was an argument that these relics should stay in India. So there's again, in the newspapers, a whole lot of debate, discussion. Should the relics stay in India? Should they go out? Um, if they stay in India, what should be done with them? You can't put them in the museum because nobody's interested. So what do you do with these relics? Now, um, what was done, and particularly this is very significant, the Mool Gandha Kuti in Sarnath, which was a new temple which was set up. And this was a temple which was set up to enshrine the relics. And here the Mahabodhi society, particularly in the 20th century, became very strident, argued that these relics should not be allowed to be sent out, but new temples should be built, and these relics should be kept in India. And uh, the people who've gone to Sarnath, I'm sure, have seen the, um, have seen the Mulaganda Kuti, uh, where uh, relics from Mirpur Khas, which is in Sindh, uh, uh, and Takshila were re-enshrined, what was also done, so there was a whole new modern, uh, modern sort of reconstruction of Buddha's life, reconstruction of his imagery. You can see the paintings, uh, paintings on top, which are all new paintings, which are all modern paintings that were done. And uh, Anagarit Dharmapal of the Mahabodhi Society was clearly very influential in this. So finally then, um, I would argue that in the 19th century, uh, archaeology, which was a new discipline, created a Buddhist sacred landscape in, uh, encompassing large parts of North India. North India, South was out of this system. You know, Alexander Cunningham didn't go beyond the Vindhyas. So South India didn't come into this story at all. Uh, and still doesn't in, in large uh, ways in which the history of Buddhism is written. Second point, Sri Lanka and Thailand got linked to the story of Buddhism very early. Sri Lanka because of the Mahabansa and the way in which the Mahabansa was then used um, to talk about Ashok and to talk about uh, the various projects that Ashok launched. And uh, the third point is, of course, the whole connection between politics, archaeology, the past, understanding of the past, used for uh, political dimensions, which I've talked about as the relics, which were gifted. And finally, my point is that if uh, there was no publicity, if these had not been reported in the media, if these exhibitions had not been held in these various Congress sessions, I would argue we would not have seen the, the paintings in the, in the Constitution because they would have had no meaning. They would have no meaning for public imagination. Uh, they would have had no meaning um, for their political content um, and in a certain way would have been uh, marginalized. So there is where I would end the lecture. I'm sorry I've taken, I've gone over. Um, we'll have a brief uh, question and answer session um, and then I'll move on to my second lecture. Thank you. So any questions, please? Hello, uh, my name is Ambarish Singh. Uh, my question is, why not draw illustrations from epics? Like Mahabharata, scenes from Mahabharata Ramayana, things like that. And uh, instead go back to archaeology. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, how much of an impact did Nazi Germany's push to archaeology in the 1930s and 40s have uh, in having these uh, things catching the public imagination. Thank you, very good questions. Uh, for the first question, um, you're right. I mean, uh, the, uh, the Ramayana and Mahabharat were not chosen as the major, um, you know, the major epics from which to draw these. Um, now again, um, you know, some 
some scholars have argued that in a, um, in a situation where the partition of India was between the two major religions, uh, choosing one over the other uh, may have created certain tensions and so Buddhism was uh, the sort of neutral uh, religious identity. That is one argument that has been made. I would like to argue that, um, um, you know, Buddhism, uh, I mean, if you actually look at uh, 19th and early 20th century, and if you are actually look at the major discoveries um, of archaeology, these are with reference to either the Harappans or Buddhism. Much less, we know much more about the Hindu temple today, you know, 70 years down the line. Then, we knew much less, and much of it was really art and architecture. Um, and um, in a certain way, archaeology being a new discipline, archaeology being reported not just in Indian media, and that is where I think it was really striking for me. Um, when you look at uh, American newspapers, for example, um, you know, the New York Times of the early 20th century, um, you find Buddhism being much more widely reported. Archaeology, I mean a lot of this, I haven't shown it here because I didn't have the time, but I can show any number of, uh, uh, of um, uh, media coverage which brought global attention to Buddhism. That global attention neither the epics had nor anything else had. There were only two, uh, two archaeological discoveries which had that global attention, the Harappans and Buddhism. And you see this from the media coverage and you know, and this so I can go on and on about that. So that's your first question. Second point about uh, Nazi Germany and what impact did that have? Um, you must remember that what we're looking at is really uh, the British Raj. And um, even as late as 1946, when we were on the verge of independence, um, it was really the British who were brought in as director generals. So um, European archaeology, um, European discoveries, European theories of the past um, had, in archaeological terms, much less of an impact because the people who were actually in charge were the British. And uh, so it, uh, I would link it much more to the, you know, to the Greek and the Roman, sorry, the British rediscovery of the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, the British rediscovery of their past and, uh, you know, uh, a sense of that being brought uh, to India, which was essentially a British colony, you know, rather than, a, uh, than, than having um, Europeans um, in charge. So that would be my response to your questions. But thanks, yeah. May, may I just <clears throat> ask, uh, I mean, it's more a remark. Yeah. Is it not irony that the, the Harappan seal was from Mahajo uh, you know, and we are in 1950 mm -hmm. or so, and this Mahajo, the sea is actually located in Pakistan. Did Pakistan not protest that, <laughs> that India was using one of their artifacts for the, for the Indian <laughs> constitution? Uh, thank you. Actually, we also use the Indonesian Borobudur uh, yes. ship, yes. you know, which actually is, it is it's not our maritime heritage. If anything, it's Indonesia's, Indonesia's maritime heritage. Um, uh, you know, um, that's a good point and um, I'm not, you know, it's really interesting that um, um, Mortimer Wheeler, who, uh, who excavated at Mohanjadaro, who came up with this theory of the Aryans and so on, um, uh, when uh, Mortimer Wheeler, he was after 46, uh, or actually 47, after partition, uh, he was appointed consultant in Pakistan. And when he went to Pakistan, he wrote a book, which is called 5,000 Years of Pakistan, which I thought, wow, you know, when did 5,000 years happen? I thought it was only three years, you know, book was published in the 50s. So certainly there was this play in the mind of the archeologists. Um, and uh, uh, the, other, the other point, you know, which Wheeler said, um, you see at partition, all the medieval monuments stayed in India. But unfortunately, the Harappan civilization went to Pakistan. Uh, so he said, well, you know, now we have to do something about the Ganga Valley, and then we have to find uh, Indian civilization in the Ganga Valley. Uh, but um, surprisingly, and this, uh, this sort of came as a surprise, you do 
see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know political arguments over the Harappan civilization in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. You know where people argue it's Dravidian, it's Aryan, it's whatever else. Um, but um, if you look at um, if you look at um, you know what Bose is drawing or what um, what um, is being shown, it seems to suggest a much broader, wider vision. Of the um, of India, rather than oh this being Pakistan and you know why are we showing which may happen today. I mean if today if something from Mohanjadaro was shown, I don't know maybe there would be a debate. But I'm quite surprised that these questions did not come up and uh, uh, people were happy using you know these seals which were then part of Pakistan certainly. Any other question on this? So, uh, I just wondered, I may have been mistaken, but was the picture on the Sati a part of the repertoire of paintings uh, that uh, Nandalal Bose chose to put into the Sorry, the, sorry what the picture it? of Sati was it part of the no, 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 no. Was this was elsewhere. Okay, this was elsewhere, and the reason why I showed it was that uh, you know there were a lot of copies made, uh, copies made on postcards and on you know uh, and sold very cheaply, both of Papu and of Sati. Um, and they were distributed very widely. So Bose did not believe in controlling art or you know, uh, keeping art for the elite. He believed that it has to be more popular, it has to go much more widely. So that's why I put those in that you know, Nandalal Bose was, uh, was an artist uh, who believed that this message should go to a larger audience than rather uh, you know, just, just selling it for a very high price and keeping it just under wraps. So, so did you come across any conversation anywhere in the archives or you know, in any of the uh, correspondences between Bose and the uh, political leaders which can show, you know, how, uh, you've mentioned this, I know, you know early on in your um, lecture, uh, but I'm interested in knowing, I mean, any specific detail as to how Bose came up with these uh, sort of themes. Not at all. You did not find anything. You just think that it was Bose's own choice, or was was it preceded by some kind of a conversation that he may have had with Nehru, for instance, or somebody else, some kind of a guided uh, uh, with regard to the choice of things, for instance. Oh, uh, not so much. Thanks. That's an um, interesting point. Uh, not so much about the choice of exactly these themes, but there is uh, there are references where Bose early on. Um, you know, comes in contact with Gandhi. Gandhi visits Shanti Niketan, and you know, Bose is introduced to him. And then Gandhi says, "Well, you know, I think we need to um, take art to the larger uh, public, and uh, you should be involved, and you should do these exhibitions." And he says, "Well, you know, I have nothing to do with it, and uh, I don't do any of this." But gradually, I think it's not so much Nehru; it's Gandhi. Um, and Gandhi draws him in into this whole notion and this whole question of art for the public, art for the people. And, um, uh, and there, when he's, uh, when he's asked, when, when he's commissioned to do uh, these exhibitions for the Congress sessions, so he goes back to Gandhi and says, Gandhi says, okay, next time this is our paintings, you do it. So he says, what am I supposed to do? You know, I don't know. So he says, I'm not the painter, you are the painter, you decide. So in, uh, in these exhibitions, clearly, I mean, there, are, there, are, uh, uh, there is archival material which shows that uh, Gandhi did not intervene uh, in his choice of um, what he did in terms of his exhibitions. Uh, and he was given quite a lot of autonomy. Now, uh, the second part, I've been looking, you know, I. Ideally, if there was a letter which said, okay, apart from that letter which commissions him, there is nothing else which says, you will draw these 22 paintings. That I have not found. So, I mean, I ask this uh, precisely because um, I find that the question that Ambarish just raised is very significant because um, we all know the kind of, about the kind of, um, you know, paintings that Bosch has been doing, you know, Mr. Shakunta, this and that, and um, yeah. right. But, uh, you know, when, when you look at the kind of themes that are there in the Constitution, for instance, there's an eye to uh, the international value of it, you know. 
know, the boat, for instance, okay. the connections. I and mean, these are the kind of things that Nehru would be extremely interested in, you know, to showcase the Nehru nation and its connections with the outside world back then. I mean, so it's, uh, it's, it's as if the nation is trying to project its, uh, you know, outreach back in the past. So it's not just otherwise, you know, the APX or something else might have been, uh, you know, um, a far more uh, uh, desirable or common choice, or a usual choice rather, I mean, I don't know. Yes, yeah, the so kind of things Bose uh, was used to painting. Uh, that is true, but you must also remember that, you see, Ajanta had been discovered in the 19th century. Ajanta was Ajanta, first, for instance, I mean. Ajanta yeah. Bose was one of the first persons, you know, who went with, uh, I think there was a Swiss lady who commissioned him to do Ajanta paintings. And Bose uh, went with a colleague and for the first time drew these Ajanta paintings. Absolutely. And these paintings had an enormous impact on Bose. Absolutely. You know, and he used these paintings when he did his panorama of uh, paintings in India. Yes. Uh, then there is evidence that, um, uh, I mean, this was when he was fairly young. But again, there is evidence that Bose actually goes and visits archaeological sites. You know, he goes to Sarnath. There is evidence of that, you know, when he goes. So, uh, my point is that um, if he was not interested in archaeology, uh, he took a lot of, and you know, it was not easy going to these archaeological sites. I mean, they're way out of, way out places. You have to get there. Uh, so, there was certainly an enormous engagement. Um, Nehru certainly, Nehru wrote his books also, Discovery of India and, you know, the, uh, the other book, uh, and certainly was there. Uh, but um, I have not talked about Ambedkar here, but Ambedkar, the role that he played in the revival of Buddhism or of Anagari Dharmapal, you know, I think you have to put it all together, because otherwise it does seem as if uh, this is sort of, uh, you know, not a... Uh, not, a, not a sort of popular choice and that epics would have been the more popular choice. I would argue the other way around because there was the writing in, on Buddhism. I mean, if you look at uh, some of the popular writings, not just in Marathi, in English, uh, what was that, Edwin, uh, the one who wrote Light of Asia? Um, uh, who's? Arnold. Yeah, Arnold's Light of Asia. That was translated in any number of languages, you know? And uh, Gandhi, in fact, says he didn't have the foggiest notion of who Buddha was until Arnold's book, and which he read it. So I think this, uh, you need to also look at uh, the popular literature that was produced in, in India at this time, the themes. Uh, there was a lot on Buddhism, a lot, in Marathi as well, in English, in other languages. Um, Ambedkar's own interest um, in Buddhism. So, you know, it's a much more complex um, complex field. And I've kind of s simplified it, and that maybe gives a sort of distorted uh, position on one or the other. So. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to need to, you need to speak in the mic, yeah. Okay. Uh, we know that British started excavating in India, so has it ever happened that uh, they manipulated the relics so as to tighten their grip on India? Like, they, knowledge is one thing, but uh, they were good at conquest, so has it? See that again, did ever? they manipulate the relics too? Uh, what was the last part? I couldn't make out. Like, manipulate the relics to tighten their grip over India. Um, well, they certainly manipulated the relics to promote um, international relations. And uh, in fact, there is a big, uh, there's a lot of media coverage. Uh, there was a bowl, a terracotta bowl, you know, which was found in the excavations at Sopara. Sopara is in uh, near Bombay. These excavations were done in the 19th century. And one of the, you know, one of the items that was recovered was a bowl. And it was argued by the excavator that this was the bowl of the Buddha. So this word spread in Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankans wanted the bowl. Uh, so there was a lot of back and forth and eventually, you know, one small piece of that bowl was sent to Sri Lanka. There was a lot of media coverage in the English newspapers saying that uh, Britain is a Christian country, that this bowl should be a bowl of the Buddha is superstition, how can a Christian nation uh, support this kind of superstitious behavior? Um, how can the British state 
send this to uh, Sri Lanka. You know, so there was a there was a lot of uh, a lot of debate, discussion, controversy about the relics and uh, how the relics were used. So, but uh, the main mainly the point was um, less. Um, I think um, I would argue that manipulating the relics to control um, the way in which Buddhism was studied in India, yes, to control the knowledge system, um, not to to, um, to cement political ties with other countries, but much less um, control over India politically. That's that would be my response. Yeah. Except that I now need my, oh sorry, how do I, where is, I need the second PowerPoint please. Excellent, yes. 
Jambu Dweepa. So it was conceptualized as an island. If you have an island, you have the sea. Uh, Jambu Dweepa occurs in Ashokan and edicts. It occurs right through. Um, there's a whole discussion on what Jambu should be, but I'll leave it at that um, and leave it for the moment. Um, so certainly the, 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 um, the country itself was conceptualized as an island. And we do get, uh, starting from very early from the first, second, first century BC, we have royal inscriptions which talk about control of the sea. So each king says, I control the three oceans. Now what that means, I don't know. But there are a lot of inscriptions which talk about the king and his control over the oceans. The other point, there was a shared cultural milieu. This cultural milieu, I would argue, is based on genetic diversity, uh, food. There was a lot of give and take across the maritime route on uh, borrowings in food, transfer of food, and so on, borrowings in language. Uh, so there was a cultural milieu which was shared. And commodities, of course, starting from the Harappan period, uh, commodities were traded and I would stress, rather than luxury commodities, I would stress the ordinary commodities, food. Food was traded, and let's be very clear on that. Wood was traded, textiles were traded. These are all medicines, uh, spices, and spices were largely used for medicinal purposes. There's been a lot of work, uh, particularly by the Anthropological Survey of India, which talks about genetic diversity across the ocean, and that um, DNA uh, mapping of populations uh, how that provides an enormous diversity to the present peoples of the Indian Ocean. And uh, this is again something which the anthropologists have been doing and have mapped. The other mapping has been on foodstuffs, uh, crops which traveled across the ocean. And this might come as a surprise, but certainly we have uh, as early as 2000 BC, uh, several crops, several African crops, coming to peninsular India, uh, sorghum, millets, and so on. We also have 1300 BC sandalwood, you know, which we think sort of originated in Karnataka, coming from Indonesia. Uh, uh, there is pepper, black pepper uh, from South India, which is found in archaeological excavations in Egypt across the Red Sea. Ginger, for example, uh, is again thought to have originated in Southeast Asia. Now, uh, coconut palm is more difficult to plot. So the point I'm making is that archaeology has helped over the years in, uh, in sort of expanding the scope of our, um, of our uh, understanding of the past, the scope of uh, what uh, it has brought, the knowledge that it has brought um, to the uh, um, to the change, to the traveling of food crops across the ocean. Fishing, we know, um, uh, has uh, dates back to at least 10,000 BC. Um, we don't have fish remains along the Indian coastline. We do have Michaelithic sites, but um, a new entrant in this whole discussion is Saudi Arabia, or the Saudi Arabian coast and the Gulf. Uh, a lot of archaeological work done in the region has led to identification of fish remains from archaeological sites, um, has led to discussions on fishing communities. And uh, the other where a lot of new work has been done is Thailand, Southeast Asia, particularly coastal areas in Thailand where again uh, fish bones uh, have been sieved from archaeological sites, have been identified and uh, you know, what species they belongs, belong to has been um, discussed. So as early as the third millennium BC, and I'm sure Dr. Tabakar will talk more about the Harappan uh, sphere of um, uh, trade and influence, but the point I'm making here is that as early as the third millennium BC, um, we do see the sea being used as a corridor. Uh, right up to the Red Sea, uh, we don't have too much, uh, uh, too much direct evidence of contact between the Red Sea and the west coast of India, but we do see the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean, and Southeast Asia, uh, the Bay of Bengal, as separate arenas of travel 
um, and uh, uh, I've traveled and you know, fishing and other maritime activity. Um, I had said that South Arabia is uh, and the Gulf. Uh, there's been new archaeological development here, and particularly this is linked to oil. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the discovery of oil led, quite surprisingly, to an increased interest in archaeology, to an increased interest in excavating these sites. Um, and some very early sites have come up in Oman and the UAE, which are contemporary to the Harappan period in India, um, which provide evidence of links both with Mesopotamia and with India. And these are the Omanar sites, the third millennium BC. You can see all along uh, the Oman, Southern Saudi Arabia, U UAE coast. Um, what these sites provide is uh, evidence for circular tombs, like the ones you see here. These have these are all uh, Bronze Age sites, third millennium BC, uh, multiple burials, um, and also uh, the fact that many of these Bronze Age sites are on the are on the global list, are on the World Heritage list, um, and so have found not just recognition. Uh, in terms of maritime history, but have found recognition in terms of universal values, in terms of the global um, uh, the global visibility of archaeology and these sites. Uh, these are some of the sites in Gujarat and the routes. Um, again, I'll just skip over that. I would like to spend time on the fish bones, particularly from two sites. This is uh, work that was done by William Belcher. Uh, he's looked at, there may be more on this, but um, particularly two sites, Harappa and Balakot. Harappa is, an in, is a site in the interior, Balakot on the coast. He analyzed the fish bones. It's not easy, as you can imagine. Fish bones are not big. It's not easy to find the fish bones in soil or to retrieve them or to analyze them. So it's a lot of very hard work and a lot of um, uh, very scientific analysis of these bones but certainly it has been done for um, two of the sites. Um, and not surprisingly, Harappa, the fish boats are much more of freshwater fish, whereas Balakot, it's much more of marine fish. Balakot is on the coast, Harappa is inland. But I think the surprise, I would argue, and um, um, I would sort of um, uh, leave it to the experts to say more on this, but I would argue that the kind of archaeological work that has been done at other places in the world, we still have to catch up, particularly if you look at sites in South Thailand, uh, where almost 100 species of fish have been identified. We don't still have that kind of a resource to build on. But let me move on to the historical period. And let me move on to this map. Now this map um, shows a uh, whole lot of uh, blue dots you can see on that map, starting from the Red Sea, which is up there, to the west coast of India. The east coast doesn't have very many blue dots. Another area which doesn't have blue dots is the Persian Gulf. Um, you know, the dots are almost missing. And I've just now, I've talked about archaeology of the Gulf and how there are very early fishing villages and so on. This map is based on a Greek text, a text which was written in Greek. It's called Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. Uh, Periplus meaning circumnavigation, Eritrean Sea being the term used by the Greeks for uh, the Indian Ocean. And um, in Greek, there were several texts which talked about circumnavigation. But this circumnavigation was mainly of the Mediterranean, not the Indian Ocean, the Greeks. This is a unique text, uh, in a certain way, written in Greek. It's also unique because it's written not in literary Greek, but in colloquial Greek. So it's written in a, in a colloquial Greek of the first century AD. What it talks about, and this is, I think, the very interesting point, what it talks about is sailing from the Red Sea which is where it starts, all the way to the west coast of India. And these, uh, these dots are all the places that it shows. So there are two routes which the Periplus talks about. If you start from there, Alexandria is up there. So if you start from the Red Sea, 
One route is the East African route, which goes down the African coast. The other route is the route that comes to the west coast of India. So it talks in great detail about the west coast route, and it says that it is far more profitable than the East African route. But remember, there is an East African route. So that's one. Then it talks about uh, you know what are the commodities in demand, who um, is uh, the king there, what can you exchange, what can you buy at a profit. What it does not talk about is religion. So it doesn't say anything about the communities, what did they believe in, which gods did they worship, um, you know, uh, things like that. But um, something um, which it does talk in great detail is the coastal landscape. So for example, there's a, uh, there's, a part, there's a section which I quote there, to set a course along the coast of Arabia is altogether risky. Since the region offers poor anchorage, is foul with rocky stretches, cannot be approached because of cliffs, and is fearsome in every respect. So these kind of graphic details of sailing is something which the text is remarkable for. In the context of Gujarat, it talks about both the Gulf of Kutch and the Gulf of Khambat. Kutch and Bari Gaza, which uh, is, um, which is uh, Broch or Bharuch, um, there's reference to both. Um, it, uh, it mentions the Scythians uh, in Saurashtra. Uh, it talks about who is ruling. And it also says Saurashtra is a very fertile zone and is linked to the interior through several routes. Then it goes into great detail how it's so difficult to find the coast. Now, I think something that you must remember is that when the um, Pericles was written in the first century, they did not have the maps that we have. They did not have Google, they did not have GPS and the rest of it nor the cartographic or nautical knowledge that we have. So the only way uh, of recognizing the coast was, was what? How would the coast be recognized if you were coming from the sea? How would you recognize that you reached Gujarat and not East Africa? What would you see first if you're coming from the sea to the land? How would the coast be marked? Louder, I can't hear. Lighthouse. Uh, lighthouses came in the colonial period, before that. What would you see? Has anybody actually done this exercise? <laughs> no. What would you, okay, think, what would you see? You would see hills, you would see specific kinds of trees, you would see buildings, um, you know, you would see any markers on the coast. Um, and the Gujarat coast, it says, and you know, you have, a, um, you have uh, the example here, it says very clearly, is hidden from view. It has shoals, shallow eddies, and uh, a long way, reaching a long way from land, so that frequently, with the shore nowhere in sight, vessels run aground and be destroyed. So clearly, finding uh, the coast, finding the shoreline, uh, was uh, an important uh, issue uh, before the coming up of, um, of maps, of cartographic knowledge. It also talks about, and this is interesting, it says that the, fish, uh, the king kept fishermen in his service. Uh, why? Because he wanted foreign incoming vessels to land at certain points and not the others. Uh, why would he want to do that? Why would the king want to uh, control where the ships landed? I mean, they could land anywhere, free world. Why did he want to control that? Yeah. So then it does not list when it enters the port or... Uh, yeah, but what, what is the king getting out of it? I mean, if the king, if the ship runs aground, so be, uh, Sorry, yeah? Uh, Excellent, yes, revenue. The revenue is coming from uh, foreign trade, and the king is getting revenue, and uh, so he wants that the ships uh, come to where his part of the kingdom is and don't go elsewhere. Um, what is also interesting is that a lot of the foreign uh, you know, commodities like horses uh, were in great demand uh, by the political elite. Now you don't want horses to go to go somewhere else and you know you have only elephants and somebody else then comes and knocks you off. So I think there is also this dimension of political contestation. 
And um, hmm, I'm really wondering whether I should go into detail on this. Okay. Uh, now another kind of uh, uh, another kind of uh, source which I think is very important for maritime history. And again, Gujarat is very favorably placed for this. Are the current uh, ethnographic studies of present communities and the Kharavas in Gujarat, their villages. Um, um, you know, there's work being done on this, on the nautical traditions of Gujarat. And there's only one point which I would like to make, which is that if you see those arrows, those blue arrows, there's a whole lot of stuff written there which maybe um, you can't read. But what it shows is the areas where people travel to from these sites. So for example, Veraval near Somnath, the ships or the Karavas, um, whose villages are around uh, the Veraval, they would go to Rangoon, Zanzibar, Aden, and the Persian Gulf. So you know there are this clear specificity of routes. They would go in specific areas, in specific directions. They just don't sail across. Uh, the uh, across the ocean. Um, the one point which I would like to draw in here is the connection between Gujarat and the Persian Gulf and the kinds of uh, evidence we have for this. One are coins. Remember I had said that uh, the Kshatrapas were one of the ruling families of Gujarat and um, you know um, uh, the Periplus refers uh, to the Kshatrapas. Uh, the, um, the evidence um, for this are coins, which again have Greek um, legends and Brahmi legends. These are bilingual coins, the Periplus does refer to it, and some of these coins um, have been found um, at sites in the Gulf. These are three of the areas uh, which I've marked. I think I'm going to close this and uh, uh, just very briefly say that uh, maritime archaeology is a new discipline. Um, it is a discipline which studies human interaction with the sea um, and what it, what it talks about, what it studies are the communities which I've talked about today but also coastal monuments, coastal structures which I will talk about tomorrow. Uh, the focus here is on small scale societies rather than empires, centrality of the coast, um, uh, sorry, rather than empires, and it brings into focus the centrality of the coast, the utilization of marine resources such as salts and pearls, but also the newly, um, the newly developing, evolving field of underwater archaeology. Uh, we don't have very many shipwrecks in this country. Um, uh, there are various reasons for that. The, early, the earliest shipwreck that we have from South Asia is off the Sri Lankan coast, uh, which is first century BC, first century AD. The earliest shipwreck we have in India uh, is in, uh, from Kerala, which is again a seventh, eighth century boat. Uh, it's not a ship, it's maybe an inshore, um, uh, a boat used uh, for the waterways. Um, but underwater archaeology is a field which is coming up and can provide more data on maritime history. With that, I'll stop. It's 4 o'clock. Thank you.